Good morning. Uh, today is Thursday, the 10th of September, and we commemorate a priest, a, a missionary by the name of Alexander Crummel. He was a priest and missionary to Liberia who died in 1898. I'll give you some more information on him later in our worship. But first, uh, let's begin with our opening sentence from Psalm 43, verse 3. O oh, send out your light and your truth, that they may lead me and bring me to your holy hill and to your dwelling. Let us humbly confess our sins to Almighty God. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against your holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done. And apart from your grace, there is no health in us. O oh Lord, have mercy upon us. Spare all those who confess their faults. Restore all those who are penitent according to your promises declared to all people in Christ Jesus our Lord, and grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may now live a godly, righteous, and sober life to the glory of your holy name. Amen. The Almighty and merciful Lord grant you absolution and remission of all your sins, true repentance, amendment of life, and the grace and consolation of his Holy Spirit. Amen. O oh Lord, open our lips, and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. O oh God, make speed to save us. O oh Lord, make haste to help us. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Praise the Lord. The Lord's name be praised. The earth is the Lord's, for he made it. O oh, come, let us adore him. O oh, be joyful in the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness, and come before his presence with a song. Be assured that the Lord, he is God. It is he that has made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people, and the sheep of his pasture. Go your way into his gates with thanksgiving, and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him, and speak good of his name. For the Lord is gracious, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endures from generation to generation. The earth is the Lord's, for he made it. O oh, come, let us adore him. There are two psalms appointed for today, Psalm 26 and Psalm 28. Psalm 26. Be my judge, O Lord, for I have walked innocently. My trust has been in the Lord. Therefore, I shall not fall. Test me, O Lord, and prove me. Examine my heart and my mind. For your loving kindness is ever before my eyes, and I will walk in your truth. I have not dwelt with evildoers, neither will I have fellowship with the deceitful. I have hated the company of the wicked, and will not sit among the ungodly. I will wash my hands in innocence, O Lord, and so will I go to your altar, that I may lift up the voice of thanksgiving and tell of all your wondrous works. Lord, I have loved the habitation of your house and the place where your honor dwells. I, O oh, take not away my soul with the sinners, nor my life with the bloodthirsty, whose hands are full of wickedness and their right hand full of bribes. But as for me, I will walk innocently. O oh, deliver me and be merciful unto me. My foot stands firm. I will praise the Lord in the congregations. The next psalm is Psalm 28. Unto you will I cry, O Lord, my rock. Do not be deaf to my prayer, lest if you do not answer, I become like those who go down into the pit. Hear the voice of my humble petitions when I cry unto you, when I hold up my hands toward the sanctuary of your holy temple. O oh, cast me not away, neither destroy me with the ungodly and evildoers, who speak as friends to their neighbors, but imagine evil in their hearts. 
reward them according to their deeds and according to the wickedness of their own inventions. Recompense them according to the work of their hands. Pay them what they have deserved. For they regard not in their mind the works of the Lord, nor the operation of his hands. Therefore he shall break them down and not build them up. Praised be the Lord, for he has heard the voice of my humble petitions. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart has trusted in him, and I am helped. Therefore my heart dances for joy, and in my song will I praise him. The Lord is my strength, and he is the sure defense of his anointed. O oh, save your people, and give your blessing to your inheritance. Feed them, and lift them up forever. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. This morning, I'm quite excited. We are beginning uh, a new study as we uh, completed uh, Paul's letter uh, to the Ephesians yesterday. We start a new epistle. Uh, it's called Hebrews, and um, what's, it's, it's a wonderful epistle. I, it's one of my favorites. Uh, and, and if you will forgive me, um, I want to change things up slightly. Um, there is some academic thought that uh, the, this, uh, if you read Hebrews, it, it reads less like an epistle and more like a sermon. And so I'd kind of like to switch it up a little bit and let the homily, the sermon, if you will, be the epistle. And so I want to share some information beforehand and then read it and let the epistle be the homily, as perhaps it was originally described. One of the reasons that some folks believe it's more like a, a, a sermon or a homily than a, an epistle is... First of all, it's anonymous. It, it doesn't, it, it, there is, there will be debate till Jesus comes, who is the author? Uh, Paul, as you know, generally starts his letters, his epistles, I, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, and here's a sort of standard that he begins and a standard he ends with. Well, this starts off by just diving right into the message of the supremacy of God's Son, Jesus Christ. Uh, so I've got to kind of change things up a little bit that way and let the, 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 the epistle be the homily. So let me begin now by giving you some background that I hope will help you appreciate uh, the next couple of days as we read uh, through Hebrews. First of all, let me in, invoke a couple of thoughts for you. You remember Jesus with his disciples at Banus, um, Caesarea Philippi, where uh, that's one of the one of the water uh, springs uh, uh, that begins uh, to form the Jordan River. It's a, a temple place dedicated to Pan. Uh, it's got temples there, a and at this place, Jesus said, "Who do the people say I am?" And then he asked his disciples, his followers, "Who do you say I am?" And Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, says, "You are the Christ." And Jesus commends him for that. Well, the question of who is Jesus is the most important question we can probably ever ask ourselves. Who is Jesus? Because the answer, quite frankly, will determine the rest of our lives and our eternal lives. And so if we put that in the background, the question of who is Jesus, or actually maybe in the foreground here, and then in the background, I want to give you if you will, Jesus' parable of the sower, also sometimes known as the, the parable of the soil. You remember this parable. It, it shows up in Matthew chapter 13, verses 1 through 23, Mark 4, 1 through 20, and Luke 8, uh, 4 uh, through 15. And you know the parable. Some seeds fall on the path or the wayside where there's no soil. Uh, the, 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 the sower sows indiscriminately. So some falls in the path, okay? There's no soil there. Some of the seed foil, falls on rocky ground with little soil. Some falls on soil that contains thorns. And then ultimately some 
falls on good soil and produces an abundant crop. And, and so remember there's that teaching from Jesus of the cares of the world or, or not having rich or deep faith in Christ and how the trials and tribulations challenge. I want you to have that in the background and the question of who is Jesus in the foreground because what is probably happening here in this, uh, this epistle, this perhaps homily, is something that happens to, I think, everybody. We are converted to Christ those of us who accept Jesus as our Savior and our Lord, and we have faith in Christ, and we know this is a wonderful gift of the Spirit. But then the trials of the world happen, the trials, the tribulations, when our prayers aren't answered the way we want them answered, and, and doubt starts to come in, or, or we, we, we commit ourselves to Jesus, and then a, 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 a catastrophe happens, and Lord, do you hear? Do you care? Are you there? Are you real? We start off with faith and then the trials of life, the tribulations of life, the terrible things that we witness, see, experience, hear about, introduce doubt. And then there's the letter to the Hebrews. And it calls us back to our first love, if you will, if our first love is Jesus. It calls us back to faith in Christ. And that's why I love this book, this letter, uh, this epistle, because I think we all grow through these struggles during our lives. And this is an epistle written for the, for the Christian who is struggling, who doubt has started to creep in because of disappointments, trials, other Christians mistreating other Christians, you name. And of course, Satan, the accuser, is always there wanting to introduce doubt and, and stir it. And so the, the purpose of this, uh, this epistle is to present the sufficiency and superiority of Jesus as the Christ, as the Messiah, the anointed one of God, the sufficiency and superiority of Jesus to be our Savior and Lord. At authorship, I've already mentioned, uh, there have been many people who say, well, Paul perhaps wrote it, Luke maybe, Barnabas, Apollos, uh, perhaps Philip, Priscilla, or others. Had an abundance of people to suggest the potential author because, of course, the epistle does not name an author, which is one of the reasons we might very well say it's probably not written by Paul because it goes against uh, the way that he normally writes his letters. But whoever the author was, we can know that it's the Word of God because God is the ultimate author and then humans write it. So this unknown anonymous writer inspired by the Holy Spirit gives us the Word of God in Hebrews and refers in chapter 13 verse 23 to Timothy as brother. So Timothy is mentioned as, the, as a brother in in chapter 13. Who's the original audience? Uh, perhaps uh, the Hebrew Christians, maybe second generation, um, who have been considering perhaps tempted to return back to Judaism, uh, maybe because of immaturity, uh, maybe because of a lack of understanding of biblical truths, perhaps because of terrible persecution. Um, there was a point in time where Christians were persecuted by by Jews and, and were actually um, expelled from the synagogues in mass. There was a prayer that basically everyone was required to pray and Christians could not pray this prayer because it was renouncing Christ and therefore they were expelled from the synagogue. So perhaps this, this was, uh, who, who knows why? I go back to faith and then trials, tribulations, and then the introduction of doubt, and then the book of Hebrews, the epistle of Hebrews, to reestablish and reconfirm faith as Christ, as the superior and sufficiency from God. When was it written? Well, there's some thought that it, was, it had to be written or, or most likely was written before 70 AD. How do we know that? because there's reference to the sacrificial system, but in 70 AD, there was a Jewish uprising in Jerusalem and the Romans crushed it and destroyed the temple 
and yet that's not mentioned here. And because it's not mentioned, and it, was a, it would have been a profound, it was a profound catastrophic event in Judaism. And for the destruction of the temple with sacrificial worship being mentioned, and yet the temple's destruction not being mentioned, probably indicates that this letter, this epistle, was written before the temple's destruction in 70 AD. So what's the setting? Jewish Christians probably undergoing fierce persecution, socially and physically, both from Jews and from the Romans. Uh, Christ had not returned to establish his Greek kingdom. Remember, there was some expectation he'll be here tomorrow. Well, not tomorrow, next week, not next week, next month. Well, in six months, in a year. We don't know when Jesus is going to return, but when one expects him to return and he does it right then and there, again, it introduces doubt. And Satan likes to stir that up. And so the people, just like we do today, need the reassurance that Christianity is true, and that Jesus indeed is the anointed one of God. Call the Christ, call the Messiah. One of the key verses comes from chapter 1, which we're reading today, verse 3. The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. And so we're going to hear that verse today uh, in chapter 2. 1 verse 3. So let's give you a little bit more background before we begin. Judaism, our parent, if you will, we're grafted in, as you know, as Gentiles. Judaism was not a second rate religion, nor was it easy to follow. It was, however, Judaism was divinely designed by God. It, it, and therefore, it is, or was, the best religion, <laughs> expressing true worship and devotion to Yahweh, to God, the creator of all things. The commandments, the rituals, the prophets, describe God's promises and reveal the way to forgiveness and salvation. There was in Judaism, and still is, a messianic expectation. The Messiah, the Anointed One, will come. We as Christians recognize that Jesus came. Jesus came as the Christ, the Anointed One, the Messiah, the Hebrew name for the Anointed One. And he came fulfilling the law and the prophets, conquering sin, shadowing, shattering all barriers to God and providing freely eternal life for those who will accept salvation through him. So you see, Hebrews is a masterful document uh, written to Jews and Christians, but again to Jews uh, primarily perhaps, uh, for those who were evaluating or struggling with this new faith, this addition, if you will, or completion, if you will, of Judaism. The message of Hebrews is that Christ, Jesus, Jesus is better. Christianity, that is, following Jesus, is superior. Jesus is supreme and completely sufficient for salvation. We don't need the sacrifices anymore. That's why it's ludicrous for Christians to go about going, we've got to rebuild that temple. We've got to rebuild that temple. Why? Yes, there's a prophecy in the book of Revelation. But the temple will not um, take away the sins. That, that time period has ended. Christ is the once for all sufficient sacrifice for sins. So Hebrews, this, this epistle, this perhaps sermon, is emphasizing that the old Judaism and the new Christianity are both religions revealed by God. And having established the superiority of Christianity as the fulfillment of Judaism, 
Jesus as the fulfillment of, of Judaism, the Messiah has come, the writer moves on with practical implications of what it means to follow Jesus. And we'll see that when we hit chapter 10, uh, starting with the 19th verse. So whatever is going on in our lives, uh, we need to understand when doubt creeps in or even before doubt creeps in, we need to understand that Jesus is better. Christianity as the following of Jesus and recognition of Jesus as the Messiah, as the Christ, is the fulfillment of Judaism and is not limited to Jews. But in fulfillment to the promise to Abraham, the promise of salvation through the Jews is open to every human being, Jew and Gentile. The dividing wall, as Paul wrote, uh, has uh, been uh, torn down. So what's the order in this, this the structure of the epistle, of uh, Hebrews? It's going to focus on two parts. The first part, the largest section, is focusing on the superiority of Jesus. Jesus is greater than the angels. We're going to pick up with that right away uh, in chapter 1 today. Jesus is greater than Moses. Jesus is greater than the Old Testament priesthood. The new covenant is greater than the old covenant. It's the fulfilling, I would add, of the old covenant. And then the second part, the shorter part, but nonetheless the important part, is to recognize the superiority of faith in Jesus as the Christ, the Messiah. And that's where chapter 10, verse 19, through chapter 13 uh, um, picks up. So as we focus on the superiority of Christ, the relation Christ Jesus, I need to make sure because Jews today are still looking for an anointed one. We as Christians hold out, you need not look, he has already come, he will come again. His name is Jesus, Yeshua, Jesus. The relationship of Christianity to Judaism was a critical issue in the early church. The author of this epistle uh, clears up confusion uh, by carefully explaining how Jesus is superior to the angels, to Moses, to the high priest. The new covenant through Jesus is shown to be far superior and fulfilling of the old. And this can be a great encouragement to help us today in the 21st century to avoid drifting away from our faith in Christ. Remember, we, I put in the background the question, or the foreground, who is Jesus? Who is Jesus to you? Most important question you could ever ask yourself. Who is Jesus to you? And I pray, and I pray very strenuously every day for folks that I love dearly, that I want them to come to saving faith in Jesus as the Christ, as their Savior and Lord. And once it comes, once the person acknowledges this love, this grace of God given through the Holy Spirit, by, purchased by the precious blood of Jesus himself, comes faith, but then come the trials. Then comes doubt. And then comes the epistle to the Hebrews, to us, to reassure us of the superiority as Jesus, as the Savior and the Lord, chosen by God, his anointed one. So with that background, uh, let's now continue uh, with the first chapter of the epistle Hebrews. Long ago, at many times, and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He, Jesus, I insert, is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name 
he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. For to which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you? Or again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, Let all God's angels worship him. And of the angels, he says, He makes his angels winds and his ministers a flame of fire. But of the Son, he says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. And you, Lord, laid the foundations of the earth in the beginning, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. You will, they will all wear out like a garment, like a robe. You will roll them up like a garment. They will be changed, but you are the same, and your years will have no end. And to which of the angels has he ever said, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Are they not all ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation? The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The author is pointing out here that Jesus is superior to the angels. He's pointing out, and remember I said verse 3, referring to Jesus, I'm going to, whatever it says he and is referring to Christ, he, Jesus, is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of God's nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, Jesus sat down at the right hand of the majesty of on high, that is God, having become as much superior to angels as the name Jesus has inherited is more excellent than theirs. What a wonderful way of beginning to strengthen and encourage our faith and cast out doubt. We continue with the song of the angels. Remember at the birth of Jesus as recorded in the gospel? The shepherds are out into the field. They're tending their sheep at night. And a whole company, a choir of angels, start singing the Gloria in Excelsis. And that's our canticle today, the Song of the Angels. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and the glory of God the Father. Amen. The canticle inspired by the angels and sung also by the church. And now the Apostles' Creed, that foundational statement of our baptism, affirming the Holy Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Three persons, one God, undivided. And then his church. And then us, the saints those who inhabit the church, the community of believers, the promise of forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting as sons and daughters of the Father. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, 
the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Sisters and brothers in Christ, the Lord be with you, and with your spirit, let us pray. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. And now as our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ, Jesus the Christ has taught us, let us boldly pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. O Lord, show your mercy upon us and grant us your salvation. O Lord, guide those who govern us and lead us in the way of justice and truth. Clothe your ministers with righteousness and let your people sing with joy. O Lord, save your people and bless your inheritance. Give peace in our time, O Lord, and defend us by your mighty power. Let not the needy, O Lord, be forgotten, nor the hope of the poor be taken away. Create in us clean hearts, O God, and take not your Holy Spirit from us. The prayer for today is from this past Sunday. O Lord God, grant your people grace to withstand the temptations of the world, the flesh, and the devil, and with pure hearts and minds to follow you, the only God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I also mentioned at the beginning of worship today that we were commemorating Alexander Crummel, who was a priest and missionary to the country of Liberia, who died in 1898. Uh, Crummel was born actually in New York City. Uh, he was, uh, uh, well, I say in New York City, I'm New York. He was born in New York. He, his mother, his father, a free black ancestry. This was born in 1819. So um, this is, uh, quite interesting and quite you know, fascinating, um, being that I was born in the South, um, that he was born in New York of free black ancestry. He had a good general education, but because of racial prejudice, he was not admitted into General Theological Seminary, which was the Episcopal Seminary uh, in New York, still exists today. However, he was eventually ordained, ordained a deacon in 1842 and a priest in 1844. He, rose, he, he, he went to England to raise funds for a new black congregation in New York, and he ended up going to Queen's College in Cambridge, and he graduated from there in 1853, so a Cambridge education. He then went uh, as a missionary to Liberia, uh, taking citizenship and combining pastoral work with headships of schools in Mor um, uh, Monrovia, and... Uh, from 1862 to 1866, he was professor of uh, philosophy and English at Liberia College, a stormy period in time. And um, he built a church and a school and established educational outreach for the indigenous people. And he served in other mission statements. But he was very strong uh, in, uh, in, in, in declaring not only the good news of Christ, but in uh, declaring... Um, uh, the indigenous population to be in freedom. Well, he wanted Liberia to be a successful light, a Christian light in Africa. And uh, when you're strong-willed, when your opinion, when you hold to your beliefs, you create enemies. And in 1873, fearing for his life, uh, that he, he, as those that he was opposed were returning to power, he returned to the United States to Washington, D.C. He became rector of St. Luke's in Washington um, until 1894. He also taught at Howard University, which is a very famous African-American university in Washington, D.C., uh, till 1897. And so, you I mean, think about that. He died 
1898. So uh, a life of service and um, what an what a example, if you will, of dedication uh, to Christ, his church, and to the indigenous people, uh, breaking down those barriers that otherwise would have been very happy to remain there. So our colic of the day commemorating Alexander Cromwell, priest and missionary to Liberia, who died on this date in 1898. Almighty and everlasting God, you called your servant Alexander Crummel to preach the gospel to the people of Liberia. Raise up in this and every land evangelists and heralds of your kingdom that your church may proclaim the unsearchable riches of our Savior Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Thursdays, we pray the colic or prayer for guidance. Heavenly Father, in you we live and move and have our being. We humbly pray you so to guide and govern us by your Holy Spirit that in all the cares and occupations of our life we may not forget you, but may remember that we're ever walking in your sight. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now the third prayer for the mission of the church, our mission together to proclaim Jesus as superior, as Lord and Savior. And this colic reminds us of the work of Christ on the cross and challenges us to follow him and to proclaim the good news. Lord Jesus Christ, you stretched out your arms of love on the hard wood of the cross that everyone might come within the reach of your saving embrace. So clothe us in your spirit that we, reaching forth our hands in love, may bring those who do not know you to the knowledge and love of you for the honor of your name. Amen. And this time I invite your prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings. Also ask your special prayers for Joy as she is scheduled for surgery tomorrow morning and uh, we'll begin that road of healing and recovery and pray for her sister Jan also. In Jesus Christ's name, Amen. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we your unworthy servants give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all for your immeasurable love and the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ. For the means of grace and for the hope of glory, we pray give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory throughout all ages. Amen. Almighty God, you have given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplications to you. And you have promised through your well-beloved Son that when two or three are gathered together in his name, you will grant their requests. Fulfill now, Lord, our desires and petitions as may be best for us, granting us in this world knowledge of your truth in the age to come, life everlasting. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. May the God of hope fill us with all joy and peace in believing through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And now words of wisdom from Fred Rogers as he gave the subtitle to his book, which I actually like more than the title, Important Things to Remember. Continuing now under the second 
sort of chapter, Understanding Love, he writes, It's the people we love the most who can make us feel the gladdest and the maddest. Love and anger are such a puzzle. It's hard for us as adults to understand and manage our angry feelings toward parents, spouses, and children, or to keep their anger toward us in perspective. It's a different kind of anger from the kind we feel uh, toward strangers because it is so deeply intertwined with caring and attachment. I think Fred is reminding us that those that we love can hurt us the most and we can hurt those we love the most. But the grace of God and the love of Jesus Christ, as I say at just about every homily I give at a marriage or when I'm called to a new church, we need to say and learn to say regularly, I am sorry, truly sorry, I am sorry. Please forgive me. And the responding words are not, it's okay. If it's, it's okay, there's nothing to apologize for. But if there's a genuine hurt, a genuine harm, then one needs to say, the, the harming person needs to say, I am sorry. And they need to back it up by behavior that reflects that they're going to amend their lives, they're going to change, they're going to seek to do better, they're going to pray for the Holy Spirit to help them, they'll seek help if necessary. I am sorry. And the response is, I forgive you. That doesn't mean, I forgot what you did, you can do it to me again, it's all cool. It means I give up the anger, the vengeance, the desire uh, to hurt you back. I forgive you. And that frees the person forgiving of the poison that otherwise would poison their soul. And even though the person who has hurt us may have died and therefore cannot say, I'm sorry. In fact, they may have died in a fit of cruelty and meanness toward us. We can still, through the power of the Holy Spirit, forgive them modeling Jesus who from the cross said, I forgive, he said, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they're doing. And through the grace of God, we can be freed from that bondage that otherwise uh, would eat away at our souls. So I think Fred may be onto something there. My friends, please keep joy in your prayers tomorrow as she has surgery. Um, I'm going to pre-record uh, morning prayer because I plan on being with Joy and Jan tomorrow. Uh, it will be broadcast uh, live in the sense that the live recording will be broadcast uh, at 10 o'clock tomorrow. Uh, so you will be in my thoughts and prayers no matter where I am, uh, but, uh, but we'll have a, a service tomorrow at 10. God willing and the internet don't fail. Take care. Bye-bye.